the growing calls across the nation to defund the police. To end policing as we know it. Off the charts violence in New York City. 11 people shot in just eight hours on Sunday. This is Sunday. about the police officers, officers who every single day put on that uniform and they run towards danger when we run away from it. Guns up. Giddy up, you know? Oh, and there was no freaking delay. Let's go. Welcome to Failure to Stop Podcast, the number one show where police meets society and culture. If you're just tuning in for the first time, we do like four shows a week, kicking the week off every Tuesday night with True Crime Tuesdays. It's Night Shift, baby, with Andrea up late. She reads us a beautiful true crime, brings us all the murder and mayhem. And then I react to it as a former law enforcement officer. Every Thursday, we come out on audio with Last Call of the Day, giving you all the other information, all the other news, so that you don't sound like an asshole first responder to your civilian friend. Probably the most important show on the network. It gives you something else to talk about other than dead babies and domestic violence. Then we've got Thursdays with the comm center, Drew Breezy, and his cohort, dispatcher John, Jonathan Yates, uh, where they, it's a call-in show. They're covering anything for, uh, you never know. You never know what's going on, but whenever they talk about it, you can call in and weigh in. Sometimes it's call in heavy. Sometimes it's not, but it's an amazing show. A lot of fun, really interactive. And then Friday is our uh, Friday breakdowns, our flagship show with myself and easy drew breezy. Mike, the cop has retired. He's retired. Mike, the cop in general, and is just going and doing the 10, seven projects. If you want to follow you can continue to do so at the 10 7 project uh and we always love them and he'll be back from time to time popping in and out uh today's show is brought to you by goatbed.com forward slash wolfpack now the time to get a bed it's valentine's day is right around the corner baby get your loved one something nice to sleep on bring in the new year right dude do it right right now they're offering 35 percent off on everything we'll have an ad read on that later um, that's all. Oh, if you want to support the show, very important, very important. If you want to support the show, follow us on Instagram, like, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, but leave us that five-star rating and review on iTunes or Spotify. That's what really drives us up. Yes. We'd love to get back onto the charts. We will be uh, reading those live every Friday. So if you, if you leave a review, we're going to read it good, bad, or ugly. I'd like to have it as a five-star even if you have a complaint, just leave a fucking five star and then give me the complaint. I'll still read it and I'll still reflect on it, but it can still help the show grow. That's all I have if you want to support the show. Um, but is there any true crime news before we get into that? One, what's tonight's topic? And two, is there any true crime updates before we jump into said topic? Yeah. Um, oh, so let me interrupt you because that's the way I always do these shows. You look beautiful tonight, by the way. And you sound even better, honestly. Thank you. Thank you. That's a little little scary for me i think i've um had a veil of bad internet in front of my face i feel like uh i was unintentionally uh you know catfishing you guys and this is the real deal the internet's clear so that's what you get it. i imagined you to look a lot better under that grainy face of yours i know i know that was kind of the that was exactly the point um yeah, so tonight we're going to talk about the happy face killer, Keith Jesperson, not to be confused with another serial killer coined the smiley face killer. We're going to cover that in another episode, actually, but tonight is the happy face killer um, who kind of had a string of murders from 1990 until 1995. So that's what we're going to talk about. Pretty interesting story. Um, some differences there than some of the other serial killer type stories. Uh, but first on updates, I think we all know still the, you know, the pressing case, the big one out there, the one everyone is interested in and learning about as time goes on is uh, the Idaho, the Moscow, Idaho college student murders. Um, so Brian Kohlberger is the suspect, uh, the man charged with the murders. He is currently, he's been extradited back. If you remember, uh, he had gone to Pennsylvania to be at his like childhood home, his parents' home over Christmas. The murders occurred on November 13th and he was arrested from his parents' home, excuse me, and then extradited back to Idaho. He is currently in Idaho. Um, the things that have come up since we spoke on it last week, we've got a little bit of DNA. 
We have some phone ping information uh, and a little more background information on him, which is what I'm almost most curious to find out about as some time goes on. So <clears throat> you'll see me looking at my notes here because I want to get these times right. But if you guys remember the uh, really quickly, there are six kids in the house, uh, two on each of the three floors. The two girls in the very bottom floor were the two sole survivors of the um, attack. And the other four perished uh, in a, a gruesome way from a stabbing that occurred. To all, they were all stabbed. Uh, the, the four that were murdered, uh, two and two, had gone off individually or as pairs. All got back to the house around the same time, just before two o'clock um, on the morning of November 13th. So we have now his phone, like his cell <clears throat> data information. And it looks like he left his home uh, per his phone information at 2.47 in the morning. So they had been home for about an hour when he left his home, which was about eight miles or 15 minutes away from where they lived. Um, he turned his phone off. 45 minutes later, his car made passes in front of the house per witnesses who later saw uh, his car. This is how his car came into question when they were talking about the Hyundai Elantra for the days uh, after like following the murder. So they saw his car make the passes in front of the house around this time. 45 minutes after that, his phone was back on and was leaving the area of the home. All right. His phone pings again just after nine o'clock that morning, which shows that he revisited the scene of the crime, right? So we hear that a lot. These things happen a lot. Right. Um, so he's come back. So that those two or three chunks of time of when he left his home and then the phone was on and off, you know, every 45 minutes or so puts him specifically in the window of when we know now we've heard from one of the survivors. We know when the, um, the students were, you know, approximately murdered, it puts him, it just aligns everything just as much as, as you could. Um, his phone, however, I think the biggest question that a lot of people had was how did he know them? You know, was this random? Was this, you know, did he have an interest in one of the girls? We do know that one of the girls, Kaylee had wounds that were um, described as much more aggressive than any of the others. So that is still interesting. That's yet to be expounded upon. Well, I've always thought my my theory with that is she if if you're killing one person and the other person wakes up, you're going to have to more aggressively kill the one that's awake. Right. But he killed. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Like if she to def, she, if she was trying to defend herself and he's having to fight her more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have mentioned this case at the bar at my bar and. Okay. This isn't the first time I've heard it, right? We heard it when we talked about this last week. Uh, everybody thinks that this guy is some kind of mastermind and that he's playing games with the court system and with police. Is this just like a fantasy that the Salus want to happen? I don't think that's meaning that doesn't happen in real life. Yeah, like do you mean that like like he didn't do it and he's playing games or he did? No, and he's like he did. He thinks he's going to get away with it on some kind of a technicality. Now, I actually well, talked to a real lawyer. And we got into this debate and he says, no, I think he's setting himself. I think he believes because he's this, you know, he's going for this doctorate that he really thinks that he has something up his sleeve. That's yes. weird to me. So I, it wouldn't, some of the things I've read about him, I'm not super sure that, um, I'm not sure that I disagree with the fact that he might think he's smarter than the system. That could be the case. I don't know that it's ultimately like a pre-planned cat and mouse toying with them situation. We had someone in the um, we had someone in the chats last week when we were doing another update about uh, Ryan Kohlberger is his name, and this guy continued to say that he thinks like, well, we'll see, and he'll probably get off on a technicality. I'm just not sure why yet. Why we're thinking that? We know that. Uh, the little bit that we do know is some really pretty solid information. I mean, outside of a confession, I'm going to touch on some DNA, a footprint, his car, um, these phone pings. There's more than a few things uh, that, that really lead to, you know, that makes sense because they were able to get that 
warrant to search his home. They were able to, I mean, they've had probable cause this whole time. So I'm not super sure. I don't know why that's something that everybody, unless it just sounds fun to speculate that maybe. I think that's the problem with the internet sleuths and why they have kind of gained the reputation that they have is because of these over speculations. And and, you know, it is fun, right? Like it is fun. We've speculated from time to time on this show, Yeah. but I think that one's in in my personal opinion, I think it's a stretch. I don't think this guy's, I think this guy personally just wanted to murder somebody because he was kind of obsessed with it. Now I will tell you this, if we're going to get on a speculation um, talking point, I could be fully, fully wrong here, and I guess we won't ever know, but I personally feel like this would have been the first of many or as many as he would have been allowed to get away with. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I this yeah. I think, this is, done. I think this was an obsession case. I think he wanted to um, to carry out something like this. Uh, so, just yeah, let's talk of- about that because we um, we're not going to spend the whole show on this, but just to touch that again, if you remember, he, he stood he, under, I believe it but she is the one who like i said has written dozens and dozens of novels she's a forensic psychologist she has a particular concentration in serial killers and she worked alongside dennis Rader, the btk killer for years and years and years in fact the two of them wrote a book together and so she's developed a lot of information um and, and i think that that kind of thing can become a bit of an obsession uh and it doesn't even have to be obsession always has a negative connotation. It doesn't have to be a bad thing, but it can become something that people just get so interested in and you can use it for good or evil, right? Like she's writing books, she's developing information and putting it out there. But Brian studied under her um, during, I believe his uh, graduate time in DeSales University. And so he studied closely under her. So you have to think that I'm going to touch on that talking point in a moment. You have to think that, uh, He's getting this information from her if he's already interested in it. He had a degree in psychology and then a degree in undergrad and graduate school in criminology and was at this point trying to obtain his Ph.D. in criminology. Uh, He had just started the semester back in August when this happened in November. We know in June he put out or at least someone with his username um, uh, submitted a survey or put a survey out to Reddit users. We talked about this last week. That was to ask those who have been convicted of crimes, particularly violent crimes, um, a a series of questions. How did you feel before, during, and after? How did you feel during your conviction? Did you feel validated in this and that? So all sorts of questions under the guise of a report. But now it does make you wonder, right? Like, was he asking this stuff because it was just because of schoolwork or because he's truly interested in how this kind of thing might make him feel? Now, saying this, he put that Reddit survey out in June And I think this is wild. Now that we're talking about this cell phone information, um, his phone has pinged close to the murder that where the murders took place at least 12 times between June of 2022 and the date of the murders, which was November 13th. Again, the Reddit survey took place in June. So the same time he put that out is the first time his phone starts circling around near where that house was. Um, And that made just be a coincidence, but it's interesting. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's obvious that this guy did it, um, or at least had a major hand that he played in it. Right. So they've found a footprint. We don't have results of that. As far as I know, I've not seen results. They're analyzing, um, I believe, a, bu- a bloody boot shoe print um, from inside the home. What we do have that does 100% have his DNA, DNA on it is a portion of a leather uh piece of leather from a knife a knife i can't speak a knife sheath that he had right um so that was found in the bedroom of one of the one of the bedrooms it's all fun and games until the shit it's the fan right like you know what you and i talk a huge people think we all talk huge podcast games you know it's it's funny because um i've launched i don't know four new podcasts in the last year including our night shift here. And it's funny, right? Because it's like leading up to the shows, you know, we're, we're super confident in our abilities to talk and our abilities to do things and things that just seem natural. Right. And then things start going wrong. And, you know, you never said, um, or, uh, or had a t- 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 ever. And I've known you for 17 years. 
And then all of a sudden when shit goes wrong, we start umming or umming. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's it's crazy. And and I, you know, I think when you're committing a murder, times that times fucking 50 or 20 or 30, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. It, you know, you're gonna make all sorts of crazy mistakes because if you're not used to working with adrenaline, we've seen that in our Friday breakdowns, right? People are like, Wow, is that cop? How did he make that decision? What a stupid decision. Right. If you don't practice being under under stress, you have no idea how you're going to act. It doesn't matter how much you war game it in your brain. When that heart rate goes up and those fine motor skills go down, accidents happen. You get sloppy. You leave your fucking holster behind. You Absolutely. Know? You're cheating so on your wife the first time. Your heart's bumping, pounding to your chest. You leave the condom wrapper on the couch. We just saw that in the movie White Lotus TV series. Oh, I still haven't seen that. So don't. Oh, it's so good. That's what I hear. I hear it's amazing. So good. Both, <sighs> both seasons. Just incredible. But yeah. one thing I've learned, if I'm ever going to cheat on my wife, hide the condom wrapper. <sighs> I'm never cheating on my wife, but if I was going to. That's fair advice. And if I'm going to murder somebody, I'm going to hide the sheath. I'm going to not forget the sheath. Or wear one whose leather is not worn thin and going to rip or I don't, yeah. whatever. So again, the uh, last little bit on this. One of the surviving roommates... These are things that we did not know until recently. How fucked is she, do you think? Well, wait till you hear what I have to say. Because I'll say it every single show. I don't even care okay. if it's redundant. But we are not privy to the information that law enforcement has, right? Sure. There's no reason we should know it. So when I say yeah. what we don't know or we don't know that yet, it's good. We don't need to. <clears throat> but... One of the surviving roommates, we have now learned this. All we knew before was that around 1140 or so the next morning or that morning, um, the roommates called 911 because if you remember, they were concerned that their roommates were unresponsive. And so, you know, we speculated. We didn't know why they would call and say that. Like, it's your four buddies. Why aren't you just banging down the door? Why, you know, we, and we all said there must have been something to that. <clears throat> Not blaming them or implicating them, but there has to be something going on. We'll come to find out one of the surviving roommates said that she heard Kaylee, Kaylee Goncalves. Now, Kaylee is the one who had the more significant wounds. She was one level above the survivors. Um, around four in the morning, which, again, this is right on the timeline that we know of, say something like, there's someone here. Uh, she said she looked outside. She didn't see anything. She thought she heard maybe some crying or whimpering from Zana's room. Zana was in the room um, with Ethan, two floors above, and heard a man's voice saying, it's okay, I'm going to help you. Uh, now, of course, we're going to have all the kinds of thoughts we have about that. Uh, I mean, I think another take could be, I don't think this is what it was, but another take could be that it was the boyfriend because she was in the room. Zana was in the room with the boyfriend, you know, so it's a male voice. Maybe it was him waking up to her being wounded and saying, I'm going to help you. You know, I don't know. But that's what this one survivor said. Um, we do have a camera on a neighbor's home, picked up some distorted audio of a voice and a whimper. It said what says distorted audio voices and a whimper um, followed by a thud. And this was at 4 17 AM. Um, she said that after she heard the crying and, um, she opened the door a third time, she saw a man. So when you said how messed up is she going to be? She saw a man walking down the hallway, dressed in black, described him as a, approximately five ten, slender, athletic, potentially build bushy eyebrows. Um, he had a mask that covered his mouth and nose and he was walking toward her and her words were, she said he was in a quote, frozen shock phase. Like he walked by her. It was like the lights were on and no one was home. Right. He just was out of it. Uh, and he walked right past her toward the sliding glass door and authorities believe that's when he exited the home. Uh, I don't know. Like we're four enough. You know what I mean? Like, and, and he was just out. He was in a different brain space at this point and, and he's walking out. So a little backstory. And then I want to hear your take on all of this. Uh, you know, we've heard a little bit from some like old friends of his high school friends of his, uh, he had been pretty severely overweight in high school, I guess, lost like a hundred pounds around the senior year, uh, which is 
it can be neither here nor there, except for a lot of people did notice quite a shift in him uh, mentally or uh, from a personality perspective around this time uh, that he would get, he would be quite the gaslighter and would get aggressive verbally and physically sometimes with people. Uh, you know, that could be because he was because the know, testosterone that he's jacked the, up on. The, the fat guy that got skinny and it also could be think about it if it was around his senior in high school he's just now getting to an age where he could potentially be diagnosed with some you know some schizoid or some um other psychopathy type thing right that he's starting to get to that age where that's when we start looking at these kinds of diagnoses so so who's to say um and then in the chats david osbornson continues to point out and you're right i was going to touch on this it's this may mean nothing, but it is a bizarre, uh, it's an interesting tidbit. Kohlberger's sister had recently starred in a movie where the whole plot line of the movie is that these victims get uh, stabbed to death. And that had just happened. Uh, anyway, these you know, take all of these little... Yeah. This is information for what I mean, they it's are, a sad, but... it's a sad, sad story. It's a tragic story. Um, well, like I said, man, if that happened to my daughter, be ending some bloodlines, but, um, uh, you know, when I saw the pictures of the blood coming out of the house, um, mm -hmm. I've actually seen that before. Um, and, uh, and you know, and that's there, that's a lot, there's a lot of blood in the human body, a lot of blood, and if you hit it just right, all that blood can come out. And, uh, and, and it's a wild thing to see. Uh, I went to a case um, where a man took his daughter to a very sleazy hotel for her birthday. Um, actually, I think it was his hotel room. I think he was just a poor piece of shit and uh, wanted to spend the, the, you know, had his daughter come to his hotel room not apartment his hotel room to hang out with him anyway he got drunk he's a white guy and he picks he started talking some shit to some hispanics and they broke into his hotel room and they carved him up with broken beer bottles and just carved him didn't stab him and i never seen more blood in my life and this little girl was sitting on the bed through all of it i think she was 12 Ugh. but this dude was laying in the he lived but it was i mean there was blood on the walls blood on the sink blood on the mirrors, blood on the pillows, blood on the rails. He got up, tried to run downstairs, realized he was blacking out. So he came back upstairs before he passed out in the doorway. I mean, just blood everywhere. So just think about how traumatic that scene must have been for anybody that had to witness it to include um, the survivors, man. Just, <clears throat> it's a, that is a tough one. That's a tough case. I hope they throw that motherfucker out of the jail. That's yeah. my opinion. I still so. do. I, I really still do think that um, if I were a if I were a bet man, I think that that wouldn't have been had he not got caught. I think that he uh, would have been on to the next sure. one. Sure, for sure, for sure. What's what do we have for tonight? What's tonight's true crime about? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the let me get rid of these. We don't. And you know what sucks is that I thought this show was going to be about the smiley face until you said. Don't get it confused with the smiley face. Eh, well, spoiler I've been confused all day because I have. <laughs> yeah, Ashley and I talked about that uh, this weekend when I was talking to your wife about that. Um, you talked to talked about both the happy face and the smiley You I, talked to my wife? I did talk to your wife. What did I tell you about talking to my wife? You said Stay I could do that wife. whenever I wanted to. Keep my wife's name out your mouth. I'm just kidding. Out your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to see this. All right, let's you. do it. All right. All righty. So. Uh, on January 21st, let's see here. Yep. 1990, the body of 23 year old Tanya Bennett was found in a remote area just outside of Portland, Oregon. Okay. She'd been, um, severely, severely beaten, raped and, um, strangled, uh, manually strangled. So by someone's hands, um, Tanya was, on first glance, everything was like normal functioning for her. She was a bit mentally disabled, just slightly due to a little bit of uh, some lack of oxygen at birth, whatever happened at her birth. But I mean, she'd get out and go around on the town. It's notable to say that because I think that she was um, more trusting of people than than some would be. That's what her friends and family seem to say. Um, so soon after her body was found, 
police receive a phone call. Okay. This is where things get interesting from a woman named Laverne, Laverne Pavlinak. We oh. do have some pictures of Laverne. Um, you want a, you want the mugshot? What do you want? Just okay. maybe just a uh, picture of Laverne you'd like. Yeah, one of her. It you can want be this her. nice one right here? That's Ooh, fine. So there's Laverne. Laverne, <laughs> Laverne Pavlinak and her her man John John um, Snavoska. Yeah, she looks like a Laverne, doesn't she? She looks like a Laverne. She looks like she might be. You said they're from Oregon. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, they look they look very Ohioan to me. They. I think that will, as you hear more and we see more pictures, you might change that. If you guys okay. are not watching currently, we have Laverne and um, her man, John. Laverne is 18 years older than John. Uh, she's got what looks like kind of like a perm. She looks just kind of matronly, just frumpy, you know, blah, just uh, n nothing, nothing really that stands out about either one of them. Um, so she gives police a call and states that her boyfriend, John, that we were just looking at there was the murderer of Tanya Bennett. She said that um, she knew for a fact that he did it, that he came home and told her about it. Uh, she could prove it. Um, she said that she knew where Tanya's body was. Now keep in mind at this point, they had released a decent amount of information. I think more so than we generally do these days to the press, uh, but still not everything. So she said uh, he told her all about it, where her body could be found, and that she had that Tanya's purse was in the trunk of John's car. So she could prove all of this. So, of course, police are chomping at the bit on this one. They go out and talk to her. Um, she even said that she had what the press released was that Tanya's pants had been slightly ripped. So she wasn't sure exactly how they were ripped, but she said that she had the piece of fabric, the denim that had been ripped from her pants and could show them that as well. And she wanted John to go to prison. She was terrified and all these things. So she brings, she brings in what she has. Um, if you have a picture you can put up, there's one, I believe of her in a red jacket where she's pointing into a wood line. Yeah, exactly. So if you're looking, you can see Laverne there. That's her showing police where Tanya's body was. So this was part of what they did to try to make sure that this was a true confession, right? So they said, okay, we'll take us. The one thing they had not fully disclosed was exactly where Tanya's body was located. Now, keep in mind, they did say, you know, outside of town, X amount of miles, um, you know, a few different things like that to get, to get you in a general direction, but she didn't know exactly where it was. So she's going to tell them, well, let me tell you, she, she tells them exactly what it was. She points to exactly in this um, heavy wood line where it's going to be. So they bring in the boyfriend, John. Okay. So he denied any involvement whatsoever. They actually put a hidden recording device in their home just to see if he says anything to incriminate himself. Right. They didn't really get anything, anything too big. They did hear her though essentially talking they hear Laverne like talking John through the story about what he had done so he's saying things like in quotes I don't remember going to no gorge dumping no body for God's sake I don't he's heard saying on tape and she says John it's the worst thing you've ever gotten yourself into don't you remember this goes back and forth and based on her statements and then he ultimately failed his polygraph they did arrest him. The denim, by the way, that she brought to show that she had that ripped fabric from Tanya's jeans, didn't the crosshairs and the fabrics didn't actually match up with Tanya's mm. jeans. But everything that she said and him um, failing that polygraph and her being able to point out the location of the body, I think that, that was more of what they kind of went off of because no one, like I said, knew they had not released that yet. So he gets arrested. Um, she, when they arrest him, she goes in and she starts changing her stories because they were, I think she was starting to think that they weren't, that this wasn't going to stick. Okay. So she changes her story to fully incriminate him by incriminating herself. She now says that she was in fact 
in the truck with him when they picked up Tanya and that they picked her up and that they had had some drinks and that he was going to have sex with her. And I guess Laverne's part in the story was she was just going to be in the truck and he was going to have his way with Tanya and that they started some weird like slapping game. Like she slapped him, like Tanya slapped John and he slapped her back and they kind of hit each other and it went from playful and kind of sexual <laughs> to aggressive and that he, uh, raped her while Laverne was present, that she witnessed him rape her and that he actually instructed Laverne to hold the rope around Tanya's neck. So now she's implicated herself to, to, to fully make sure that he is securely implicated in this. Right. So they arrest them both. So <laughs> the court case, the court comes up, it's time for her to go to court she immediately takes the stand. We, you know, we've heard these kinds of stories. Uh, it's not a good idea. If you're charged with murder, please don't um, represent yourself. And she took the stand and said that, you know, that was that that was made up that she wasn't there, but he did do it. Whatever. Doesn't matter. She was charged with 10 years. Um, I forget what he was charged with, but they both go and they are in prison. And they are both in prison with either the murder or, you know, being associated with this murder. And there they sit. So we're going to put them on the back burner for a moment. Right, so, so Laverne, uh -huh. she's in prison. Uh -huh. Man, she, she looks like she's from Ohio. I just went to Ohio not too long ago. That's what she all the girls looks look like so in the bar. pissed. Yeah. Well, people are happy in Ohio, but they have the, you know, the hair, the glasses. A lot of women look like that in Ohio. Well, so beautiful, beautiful, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So you just let's keep those in the let's put those in the separate part of our brain and then we're going to move on and we're going to switch gears a little bit to Keith Jesperson. So Keith Jesperson, Jesperson, excuse me, is the man that's known as the happy face killer. And we'll talk all about why. Um, Keith was born in Canada to um, his parents, Les and Gladys. What? To cheat? I don't know. Dad um, like says, Laverne, I'm just going to interrupt you because this is too good. It, says, it is funny. Laverne looks like the type of person to cheat at bingo night. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. If you're listening and you're trying to figure out what Laverne looks like, you could one, go to our Instagram, but two, uh, we can just paint you a, a verbal Bob Ross here. Uh, she looks like she would cheat at bingo night. One hundo. <laughs> that is good. Thank you, Deb. <laughs> oh my goodness. So Keith has, um, as he grows up, we're going to see that he has a lot of the points that we look at when we talk about the psychopathy of someone that becomes eventually a predatory killer, a serial killer, uh, and what have you. So he was born in 1955, like I said, to Les and Gloria. Um, or excuse me, Gladys Jesperson in Canada, he, um, at a very young age, so like five, six years old started, what? I feel like it could be a, a quiz. What did he do? Like from the back, torturing animals, right? Boom. Check. He, um, check. He like bashed gopher heads. He, it's actually gets pretty, you know what? I will touch on this. I've heard so many podcasts about this and I've read so much. And three or four of the people I heard talking about it, and I've listened to this case on and off for a few years. This is an interesting one. We'll start to talk about what he did with the animals. And it is terrible. Like, I, I'm not going to say it all myself either. But then I just find it interesting, on a side note, that as humans, we can say things like, I, I'm not even going to touch on what he did to the animals because it's so terrible. But let me tell you how he beat this woman's skull in and raped her. and You know what I mean? And we talk about that in detail. And for some reason, we're like super interested in those details. Right. But it's too difficult to tell you what he did to a kitten. Isn't that strange? That is strange. Anyway. Although, fuck kittens, you know. I but was that's at my the opposite. That people, people don't want to hear what he did to the animals, which I don't want to hear it either. I mean, I, I guess it's needless it. because it's it. not I mean, necessary. If it's to a kitten, I want to hear it. I, I'd love to hear it. Uh, well, the stupid fucking what? The, what is a PETA? Those PETA commercials or SPC? Not what PETA. Is it? I, it's PETA. Yeah. Whatever. What, what's the ones where it's like for three dollars for sixty cents a day? You can. And say, Sarah McLaughlin is singing in the back. Yeah, dude, it makes me just want to just 
butcher animals and not eat them. It doesn't stop it. Just to butcher them. Stop. I hate them. I, it makes me hate animals of all kinds. No, kind. I'm not going to tell you. No, I'm not going to tell you what he did. I want to know what he did. No, you like touch it myself much. while I hear what he did. <laughs> uh, I felt dark saying it. I felt bad when it came out of my mouth. Mm. Good. My wife's not listening. Well, so again, he was very young, right? Five or six. He, um, ugh, yeah, he did. He would put um, a few other things. Would be, he would be do things like uh, tie cats' tails together and like hang them over a rod, and they would just basically hang there until they, they would claw each other to try to get free, right? So they would just claw until one of them died. Um, and that's one of the least egregious or like just malicious things he did. Everything that he did definitely caused like a slow death. But this makes sense when we've talked about the psychology of a lot of these killers, right? Like it's the, most the power, he, you know, it's um, I, that's, I guess that's subjective. I mean, what I consider it might be different to you. I mean, even like he would nail cats and small dogs to boards and just like kind of poke them with pins and needles. Like it just oh. like, think, so it was just like, it, this is at five and six years old. You know what I what? mean? Like think about your children at these eight or anybody, but these children at this age. So, but these things, when you think about it, if you can get it outside of the emotion of it being so terrible, it makes sense, right? He's exerting control. Like he's showing that he is essentially playing God, right? Like he's able to, do these things um, and whatever is drawing his brain to feel fulfilled by doing them, who knows, but that's, that's what's happening. So anyway, so we already have like check one of the triad there off, off the list, but animals, his father um, was a heavy drinker. He did uh, physically abuse uh, mm -hmm, Keith. We've heard some reports there are fewer and farther between that. His mother must've might've been potentially physically abusive. We don't have any accounts of sexual abuse. I'm telling you, parental um, illness, man. Parental illness is the cause of like 99.99% of all of there's these There's a issues. lot here. And I mean, that was that was one of the things. Casey Anthony, of... parental illness. Brian Landry, mm -hmm. parental illness. This mm -hmm. fucking guy, parental illness. Like, if they know, if they've got a documented that five and six, he was nailing fucking cats to a board, then his parents knew he was nailing cats to a board. It's not like... Like witnesses just witness a young right. boy nailing something and don't tell the parents. So the parents know. And I'm telling you right now, you can spank that behavior out of any child. You can That's absolutely, true. yeah, it's absolutely true. You hit a kid hard enough for doing something wrong, he won't do it again. If it's not abusive, you know what I'm saying? Like there's a fine line in teaching a kid, but like you know, I remember when I was a young kid. I was watching Mighty Ducks. It was when Mighty Ducks first came out, and I really wanted a hockey stick. My parents bought me a hockey stick uh, for, for Christmas. I Did lived someone in tell you you looked like Emilio Estevez? Yeah. Yeah, from a real early age. Better than Goldberg, I guess. Um, it's probably more like what I look like now. Um, but I lived in Florida, and there was no hockey. Well, one day, we had a big toad problem because we had a pond behind our house. So one day, there was like, like eight or nine toads on our driveway. I guess I don't know if they were just getting warm on the concrete. I don't know what they were doing, but there was a whole bunch of them. And I thought this was awesome to go and whack each one of them off of the driveway with a hockey stick, big giant toads. And I thought it was super funny. Smacked the first one, laughed, smacked the third one, just thought it was real funny. Called my dad over to show him, smacked the third or fourth one. My dad took that hockey stick from me and he hit me in the side of the leg, like right where the dead leg is. Like when you dead leg somebody. Mm-hmm. Caught me right there. I think it was my first dead leg that I ever had. I must have been like six or seven years old, probably maybe eight. Caught me right there. Right. I thought he broke my leg. I hit the ground. He threw that hockey stick at me. He gave me the sternest talking to. And even as much as I hate animals today, I don't even hunt. I don't enjoy killing animals. I would never hurt an animal that I didn't have to, to do it to eat. Right. But I mean, if he wouldn't have beaten the shit out of me, uh, he didn't beat the shit out of me. He just hit me one good solid time with a hockey stick in the leg. But but I don't think that if he hadn't have done that, you would have started nailing kittens to a board. Do you see what I'm saying? Like there is a certain thing as mental illness separately from parental. Yeah, but I think I think anything. parental illness can fix. I, I think if you're a good parent, you can you can. There's a lot of people out there that are pretty fucked up in the head and they're not nailing kittens, kittens to the board. I, I wish it was that check. easy though, right? I wish it was that easy because you can have the best parents in the world and kids still, things can still happen. Like if yes, it were that happen, easy, that sure. would be great. 
but, but I don't think nailing kittens to a board would happen. If you're a good parent, you're not going to let you. If you know that your kid's nailing something to a board at six years old, there's no way he's going to grow up to be a serial killer. Because you're going to put, if you're a good parent, you're going to put that kid, you're going to get him all sorts of help and love and tender care. Well, let's look church at that. This was therapy, 1961. Okay, this was 1961. It's not going to do this, that for him. True, true. But even if he had good parents, then let's go down that rabbit hole for a moment. Even if he had had good parents, and his parents were terrible i will agree with you and it goes on to be more terrible as time goes on right but let's right. just say that that wasn't the case it was 1961 mental health number one just really wasn't talked about and it was really heavily misunderstood when it was talked sure. about and the treatments that they would use you know i would take care of a lot of times children when i worked in one um sort of facet of care with pediatrics that would um, often, we had a handful that would come for us to do some maintenance treatment on that had come from other countries. And the other countries were still using some of the uh, therapies, if you will, take that term really loosely on children that we would have used, you know, back around this time, actually, not far from this time. And um, that caused far, far more harm than good, right? So, so even had he had good parents, and even if they thought, let's do this, they might not have even thought mental illness. They might have thought, man, why is Keith doing this to animals? That's terrible. And not, we know now that that's a precursor to terrible, terrible things later on, right? They might not have known that then. I just don't know. It, it doesn't change but when your brain chemistry is a certain way. You can't, you don't parent that out of someone. Now, I do agree that you can use your good parenting and your love and your attention and your resources properly and have a much better outcome in certain situations than you would otherwise. Absolutely. And bad parenting is going to lead to worse results every time. But I don't think that you can always good parent yourself out of a situation. Unfortunately, you know what I mean? I don't yeah, know. I don't know. I disagree. I think uh, I think you can good I think you could good parent your way out of not producing a mass shooter. You can good parent your way out of having a kid that doesn't stab four children in a uh, college dorm room. You can good parent your way out of not dragging, you know, some girl out to the butt fuck nowhere, Oregon and raping her and, and killing her. I mean, I think at that point, like you have, if that happens, then you've completely failed as a parent completely failed as a parent like that's your one job you is know, to not raise a piece of shit that goes on a mass killing spree you know what would be interesting is and i'm not sure how accurate the data would be but it would be interesting to do a show where i take a long time and really look into the parents right, right. of all these like a, quite a handful just but you know not for arguments for arguments sake right just so we can like debate it that would be interesting to see like what does that look like you know is it that 90 percent of them were terrible is it that yeah. you know that'd be interesting to see now but i mean like it would be it. subjective too like i i feel like when you look at the totality it's in anthony's case you know that you know for me that's terrible parenting were they abusive i mean debatable we don't know i mean she says that they were uh, they're you know we'll never know right but like even on the server, like even them lying so much about her high school diploma and lying about, you oh, know, yeah. all they the, the places she were, you know, they, they were terrible parents. They weren't, you, they didn't, you don't have to be abusive to be a terrible parent. I mean, like, like I said, spoiling a kid, you know, might be the problem. Yeah. Spanking a child that doesn't even spank. Like if I spank my middle child, I don't get the same result as if I spank my oldest child. Agreed. Um, I, I can spank my youngest child or I mean, my, my middle middle child <laughs> i can i can spank my five those year old are, those my are terms you're gonna have to go other than oldest and youngest you can't say the rest right. anymore you're gonna have to right be i can't you know my my middle. oldest and child one m2 he, and m3 my my 10 year old i just turned 10 this week so it's weird to say that but you know i haven't spanked him in like two or three years but you know he was a hellion he was a he was a mischievous wild child and he had to be tamed like a horse and, uh, you know, we spanked him a few times, you know, mom spanked him, broke a wooden spoon over his butt one time. Wasn't until I got out the belt and really got after his behind and, and got one of those cries where he like couldn't breathe cause he was crying so hard. And then ever since then, the kid's been a doll. I mean, he's been, he's been a, you know, a wonderful child. He's got his own podcast. He's on the straight and narrow. Now, if I spank August, he'll shut down for 
three days and won't talk to anybody. I mean, it would be like the end of his life. I think it does more mental damage. So we spanked him like maybe once with a wooden spoon. Realized, wow, that was a fucking wrong move because that kid does not react well. So now I have long talks with him, which do just as much as a spanking. Uh, he'll get the, you know, cries from just me sternly talking to him. Um, and, you know, I would say arguably August is probably my least difficult child he's probably the most well-behaved um but elkin he's another one. he's like a little terrorist so you know i have to put him in check and, and spank him up pretty good um and i know that you know he's Don't only five that. i can't mm-hmm. handle that Don't say spanking that. elkin i haven't yeah, done in a while but yeah dude, he's a, he's like he can he can be a little bit directly disobedient you know and that's that's a problem when a kid's directly disobedient you got to shut that down real quick you know, Look, go do this. Yeah. And then they just don't do it. Oh no, not on my watch. So he's learning though. He's good. I haven't spanked him in a hot minute. So, but you know, Look I don't know. Baby. Okay. I know we're not doing this because we have listeners, but I'm showing a look at that little elk. In oh, this look weekend. at that. Yeah. He's a terrorist. No, he's you. not. All right. All righty. All righty. But you know, anyway, I'm, I'm just saying like, you know, th- this guy, he's, he's uh, neglected by his drunken father and he's, allowed to get away with nailing a, I, i'm telling you right now my child would not ever nail another animal to a board if i caught him doing it once i'll, I'll i could bet you my entire my, my my real life i'd give you my heart out of my chest i promise you if he did it once and i knew about it he would never do it again well then he would just start wetting the bed or starting fires because that's the other well, two would, of the tree wouldn't let him do that circles. either Wet the bed. Be the last time you wet the bed, homie. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so, all right. So, <clears throat> this gets interesting, though. So, uh, his now his dad again. I am not arguing that his dad's terrible. His dad is terrible, and it a hundred percent contributed to things being completely worse for this guy. I, I don't. I don't doubt that a bit. Um, he drank heavily. Uh, he was domineering. He looked down on women. He put women down. Uh, so Keith had, uh, four siblings, two brothers, or I think three brothers and a sister, but it was like two and two, like two were older than him. Two were younger than him. He was truly the middle child. Um, he received very little attention from his father compared to the rest. And what he did was definitely more negative than what the rest received. Uh, case in point by 11 years old, Keith was paying $30 a week room and board to his father. So he had, he was made to uh, work and make money. And then that money was put into room and board. Uh, Eventually his siblings were also made to pay, but not nearly as much and not for, from as early of an age, his earliest memory that he recounts was of rolling a rock down a slide in a play or in a park, excuse me. It hit his little brother on the head. Uh, It drew some blood and made him cry. So he will count that as his earliest memory. I will uh, I will mention things here and there that he that he says or that he will state as fact. Keep in mind, we're taking all of this with a grain of salt because he fits the mold in so many ways of a lot of these guys we talked about that do these kinds of things that really wants a lot of attention. And he really his grandiose ideations of his own self are such that he considered like he beefs himself up by making all these things sound worse. So Anyway, but that's what, what he says is his earliest memory. Um, when he was around seven, they moved from Canada to Washington. Uh, he was a big boy. So current day as an adult, Keith stands between 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, uh, 250 pounds. They say 250. There's no way. He's got to be more than that because he's not super skinny and he's very, very, very tall. Um, so big, big man. So you can imagine as a boy, he was a, he was a big boy and he got made fun of for this. He was very much taller, head and shoulders over everyone. Uh, they called him Igor, baby Huey. Um, he was content to play alone. He was very, very shy as a child. Uh, so he starts getting into physical alterations or altercations, excuse me, when he was around nine, evidently he called, um, a lady, a bitch that was in a car and the 16 year old, which I'll say pretty sure he probably heard his father saying this about women. Often we know that his father talked down to women. Um, but the woman's son who was 16 got out of the car, uh, slugged him a couple good times and kicked him. Um, but then 
the story goes that Keith's father got wind of this and beat him until he couldn't scream anymore. Uh, so that's bad. Yeah, I mean, spanking and beating are two different things. <laughs> no, he didn't spank him. No, he literally no, he, he like, beat yeah. him. Yeah, until yeah. he couldn't scream. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, this is bad. This guy was bad. Bad news. See, I you know how when I was a kid. If I got in trouble, you know, that's, that's the problem with these kids now is that they're too spoiled, but you know, me having a ghost bed, I want to get in trouble because I want to be sent to my room so that I can take a time out on my ghost bed. They've been a loyal sponsor since day one. Uh, all of our fans rave about them. Go back and check our iTunes ratings, which we hope that you leave one here soon for us so that we can read it for you on Friday. But you'll see lots of mentions on ghost beds. Uh, lots of uh, the Wolfpack members, uh, the paid subscribe members of the Wolfpack, um, sent me lots of photos of their ghost beds over the holidays, and that's always appreciative. Uh, the reason why we love ghost beds so much is that they're made in the good old, help me now that you don't have a delay, USA. You son of a bitch. Uh, this is why Russia's winning. Every match has a 20 year warranty, and you can try it out for not a hundred and nights, not 99, not 98, but 101, baby. If you don't like it, you can return them. No hard feelings, but yeah, won't. One of our favorite parts about Ghost Bed is that each mattress has that cooling technology in it, so that if you get hot at night, like we do right here in North Carolina in January, hitting 62 degrees today. Uh, these things are a lifesaver. Ghostbed also offers bundles so that you can get everything you need. You don't even have to really think about it. Just choose from their four mattresses and pack your bundle. Whether you just need a mattress and an adjustable base uh, or a frame or you want it all, I want it all. I want it all. I want it all. I want, and I it, want now. it now. Like their cooling pillows and their sheets, you can get the best bang for your buck. Right now, GhostBed is offering a flash sale, 35% off. GhostBed bundles where you get a measures and adjustable base. Um, use that promo code Wolfpack, baby. GhostBed.com forward slash Wolfpack, $35 down, thir zero down, zero, um, 35 a month, zero down, 0% zero financing. And that's if you have Ohio credit. Um, shout out to all my Ohio fans. Jay Kiefer out there from one more and I'm out of here podcast. One of my favorite podcasts aside from my own and from Gromit vomit. Um, uh, but I really do like listening to those guys, but uh, sidetrack ghostbed.com forward slash Wolfpack. Oh, I'm not howling. Oh, you too good for a good howl. Are you got your, you got your high speed internet, your nice camera, your new little studio room, and now you're just too good to howl at the wolf pack? Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> I guess Skate Daddy, it's a parental illness. Skate Daddy's not doing his job to come over there and, <clears throat> ow, my fucking arm. Good. That's what you're just, got, just got my cast off. Still a little weak, boys. Still a little whatever weak. Whatever just happened girls. is what you get for whatever you were just about to say. Mm. Mm. All right, let's continue on here. All right, let's do uh, it. This so guy's got a piece saying, of shit. Just got his ass whooped by by a sixteen year old, and then by his dad. Really, really bad his dad. So again, uh, big boy, right? Because he turned into mm -hmm. a giant man. But this was a cause of concern because it it did isolate him. He was very much so made fun of. Um, so evidently, he played with a boy named Martin for a long time. Um, but Martin. Sounds like was a bit of a snitch. She would always blame Keith for his wrongdoings and Keith would get quote belted in front of everyone. So dad would bring that belt out in front of all the friends and get him. So Keith had enough and he beat Martin unconscious. And he will say that he would have killed Martin if his father didn't pull him off. This is interesting though, because this is the first time, this is the first time that we know that um, Keith, has mentioned the idea of murder um, outside of animals. So with a human saying that I for sure would have murdered him had I had the opportunity, he wasn't coming off. So the kid, keep in mind, he was nine or 10. Martin was eight years old and he beat this child um, unconscious. Mm. So <clears throat> anyway, so we're going to move on. He's done some like some indiscretions with a BB gun and some neighbors there was a second time as a child, and then we're going to move into the adult stuff uh, and, and start start wrapping that up. But a boy held Keith's head underwater 
at one point while they were swimming at a lake until Keith, quote, saw black. All right. Keith is starting to get tired of these kids giving him a hard time. And uh, they were at a local swimming pool not long after this. And he held the boy's head underwater until a lifeguard pulled Keith off of the boy. And now he says for a second time, I would have killed him had I not been pulled off of him. Like that was fully my intention. <clears throat> so uh, he gets introduced only to shots with. Say what? Only once. You'd only do it once in my house. Oh, yeah. The, mm-hmm. Okay. Just thinking about all the ass whoopings that dude would have gotten. Not beatings, but just a good, I solid, lovable for, ass whooping. Listen, I love you. And I think for as many children as you are blessing this world with, be careful before you say never because kids do things. I, I don't mean this kind of crap, but kids do things that no matter your best intention, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. They don't fucking mur- They don't hold a kid's head under the water. I don't mean. I them. don't mean murder. I'm just saying they kids do things they shouldn't do. Well, I get that kid. they do it all the time. That's why. That's why if, if they didn't, I wouldn't have to. Uh, I wouldn't have to. Um, like I said, they they only do it once though. I'm gonna fuck up. Okay. You're only gonna do those things one time. You're only gonna hold a kid's head under the water one time in my house. Then you're gonna learn why we don't do that in my household, and you're not gonna do it again. You're gonna learn from that mistake. Quick, fast, and all I'm sorts of hold your head underwater. It's like the military. You'll only drop your rifle once or twice till you figure out, man. I I should probably not drop this rifle anymore. They make it hurt when I do that. Um, I'm just not gonna do it anymore. And you learn. You figure it out real quick. All right. I just I hate to see it. I hate to see well, these kids getting away with all this. You know, it's a lot of shit he's getting away with. Well, yes and no. I mean, like, but it's yeah. I mean, he's getting. You can't be surprised that it's going to well. escalate to some kind of a crazy murder. Okay. Well, listen. So, um, uh, this was interesting. Uh, there was a classmate's recollection of Keith when he was about like looking back at when he was about like fourteen years old. Okay. Uh, and it says. This guy says he could be bright when he wanted to, but then he would do something stupid. That's, I mean, but that's, I've got a 13 year old and I could say that all day long. He'd be too kind or too mean, too generous or too stingy. You never saw the in between. I always wondered if he was in control of his own brain, if he might've had brain damage. He sure acted like it. So this is what a kid, this is what an adult said later that known him as a child. Um, We have a lot of that. We'll talk about some psychological testing he had done later on. And there was a lot of either or not a lot of in between. Uh, He did have a strange fascination with fires, which now we know is not a strange thing. It's a symptom of all of these things. Uh, His grandfather did too. He didn't do anything too egregious, but he did set some fires um, on the side of the road. I mean, things he shouldn't have done. Uh, Right, right. But, you know, he didn't like set his... Why do you think that is a thing? Like, Why do do you think fire is a thing for serial killers? Do we know that? Do we know why that's a thing? Um... You know, I, I don't know. I'm sure like we've got plenty of people listening who could say, but my thought would be the control. It's, mm. it's just like it, it's very similar to sitting back to watch the animals handle what you've done to them. You light it mm. and you can sit back and watch what you've done oh, and no. maybe even just the consumption, right? Like the devastation that it causes, like the the control and consumption. I don't I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. But that's one. So, so we got the fires and we got the animals. Boom and boom. Where's we Jake Kiefer when you need him? Where's the fire chief in the chats? He probably knows why serial killers like fire so much. Maybe. Um, we don't have any recollection or any um, notes on him wetting the bed. I have looked that up. There's not any. Um, in fact, I think it says no or unknown. So that wasn't anything notable. Just to kind of round that out there that we talked about earlier. So anyway, he did get rejected by the girls he liked. He never went to a prom or dance. Um, <clears throat> he had sexual intercourse for the first time at like 14. He did say that at one point he described it as rape, but then later he's discounted that. So that's why I say what he says, I would take it with a grain of salt half the time. Once he's these interviews that he's had since he's gotten in prison, like, it, you know, I don't know. I don't. You got to be careful what you believe with him. Anyway, so we're going to move on forward. Like his dad shot his dog. Um, But then this is interesting and it's actually worth mentioning. When he was around 17 or 18, he had gotten teased because in gym class, 
at least then, uh, there's the rope, right? That that goes mm-hmm. all the way up to the ceiling from the floor. And you're supposed to climb this rope and ring the bell at the top. And okay. he would always get teased because he could never make it to the top. Well, when he was around 17 or 18, junior, senior year of high school, he did. He made it to the top. Fuck and yeah, as he gets all the way to the top, it's around 25 feet up over this, you know, the wooden gymnasium floor, falls from the top, broke his hip, Ooh. busted his head up, bleeding out, busted skull, uh, frontal lobe impacted. So when we were talking about the psychology of things, your frontal lobe controls your personality. If you never cussed before, you could have frontal lobe damage and all of a sudden your preacher down the street is saying things that would make you blush. You know, like your frontal lobe controls your what makes you laugh, what uh, your own humor, it control, you know, all anything to do with what makes someone feel like who they are for the people who know them. That's what controls it. So this happened to him. So we already know his history. We know his abusive father. We know his tendencies toward terrible things. And now this has happened. So, so this kind of definitely plays a part moving forward. All right. Um, his IQ was 102 when he graduated average in the United States is around 98 or a hundred. Um, and that's just kind of like average, average his actually is, is average or, you know, a couple points higher than most serial killers. So kind of same, same, uh, his mom died when he was around 30 And then he got married to a woman named Rose. He proceeds to have three children, okay? A few years later, four or five years later, he files for divorce, and he takes up truck driving. This is interesting because... (laughs) Because, check. (laughs) Uh, Sorry, anybody who's listening to the truck driver on your long drives, thank you for listening to us, and we love and appreciate you. One of my favorite Wolfpack Wolfpack members is... uh, it is a truck driver, and um, actually, he's the one that gave you that Hooters outfit with the bleach pen. But Thank right, you like, for that. like if bleach you would pen. Like to write in and explain why the the he said because sick, because the, the Hooters. Made me, it made me he scared. said he said because you drink wine, and the pajamas are white, and so if you spilled the wine on the pajamas, you'd have a bleach pen to, to clean it off. So he's fastidious. I don't know that word. It's too big for me. But I trust that you, I'll trust your judgment on that vernacular. As long as it wasn't to clean up like my own blood spill after he drove his truck to murder me. I actually tried to give him your address, but he just said he didn't feel comfortable giving it to you in person. <laughs> Thank I you so I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was like, well, just don't take it to her house. Take it to where she works. She works at 713 <laughs> East Palmetto Drive. That's the one. Know. So See y'all there. <laughs> Nail her to a board like a like Keith's cat, like a kitten. All right. Um. So so he gets married, has his kids. He uh, takes up truck driving. So let's move on. His murder. You ready for this? His first mur- murder was a woman named Tanya Bennett. Does this ring any bells? Does anyone remember the beginning of the show seven hours ago when we talked about a certain Tanya mm. Bennett? And we have Laverne mm-hmm. and John Uh-oh. in prison Uh-oh. for Tanya murder. Bennett's murder. What? Yep. So Laverne and John were in prison for from nineteen, yep, from nineteen ninety until nineteen ninety five, when Keith ultimately was found um, was brought in on charges of a murder of one woman that we find out was his eighth. Okay, his first was Tanya. That was a smiley face. Whoa. We just showed a picture of um, Keith uh, in the sand with a smiley face, which that picture is like, that's one where you just want to like, if you never want to punch him in the face, punch him in the face now. Cause that's Keith after he's been incarcerated. He's uh, the picture we're looking at. He's older. He's already been in prison for these murders. He is still currently in prison and watch in the Oregon state penitentiary for these murders. That's him being silly and thinking he's funny with this smiley face in the sand. The reason he's called the happy face killer is because as many of these men, these serial killers do, they taunt police and journalists with notes and letters. And when he did that, he would draw a smiley face. So that picture of him in the same smiley face makes me want to The smiley face is eerily, eerily close. I know exactly what you're going to say. Exact smiley face that my mother draw drew on my napkins every day when I went to schools. My mom would always fold a napkin and say like, 
have a good day. I do Smiley too. Face. I love you. Or Happy she Monday. would, yeah, she would, yeah, right. She like that. But my mom's like, even how the eyes are like more like U's or like sixes, mm-hmm. you know, like that's how my mom drew a smiley face. Is mom your mom's name Laverne? No. So, um, yeah. So his first victim was actually Tanya. So we're going to talk a bit about Tanya and we'll talk a bit so, about okay, his So what last happens victim. to Laverne and John? Like, how does Laverne know? Yep. All this shit about where the bodies are hidden and stuff. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Right. Okay. So I'm following. She even, so she says, I'll tell you exactly what she said. Um, so when, when all of this came out, when he first heard about the arrest of these two people and Tanya Bennett's murder, if you can put up, there's a, um, writing that he did that's on a bathroom wall so it looks very messy because the bathroom wall itself is very messy or the stall do you see that um, that's that to you no uh-uh. no no um he well i can read it to you he give me three seconds so when they were arrested um, he was far away on his trucking route, right? So he goes mm-hmm. through the United States making the same lap. And he wrote on a bathroom stall, I killed Tanya Bennett, January 21st, 1990 in Portland, Oregon. I beat her to death, raped her and loved it. Yes, I'm sick, but I enjoy myself too. People took the blame and I'm free with that smiley face. Um, Damn, dude. Right. Wow. So, um, so that's the first time that we. The see only thing I ever wrote face. on a bathroom wall was "I got head from, you know, Cynthia." But you didn't. Da-da-da-da. No, I sometimes I write for a good time. Call Andrea up late, and then I put your phone number on the. That stall. explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Um. <laughs> So that's the first time that we see his happy uh, face. <laughs> Just stop talking. Nothing, nothing is going to come out. It's going to be fist good. me, Andrea Uplay, phone okay. number. Okay, <laughs> and we're done here, folks. I got a lot. I got a lot. I've enjoyed failure stop night shift, and uh, you guys can I'll <laughs> figure be out the rest my of the story on your own. <laughs> good luck. Done. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Go to our Instagram tonight. No, and no, I want no, your best. Nothing with that. I word. want. What? What are you saying? No, listen. I want your best bathroom graffiti. I want to know, like, what's the funniest bathroom graffiti or craziest bathroom graffiti that you have come across wherever. I want to hear about it. Send it to us on our Instagram. DM us at failure to stop and DM us your craziest uh, bathroom graffiti that you know of. Speaking of um, things we ask you to do, we'll do what we'll do it at the end. But we have the um, doppelganger episode from last week, uh, the giveaway for the Manscape 4.0. So we have a winner, and we will we will do that at the end of the show. So the reason the way Laverne was able to do this, or let's say why was she able? Why did she want to do this? She was in an abusive relationship with John and wanted to get out. So instead of fleeing, she implicated him in the murder of Tanya Bennett. Uh, she did so much so again that she implicated her own self. I'm not sure she or John were very stable mentally whatsoever. She convinced the man to say that he had done this. And then on top of that, she, um, um, th- so then on top of that, he confessed. And the reason he pled guilty was we didn't touch on this earlier. The reason John pled guilty is so that he could avoid the death penalty. Uh, cause he was told if he pled guilty, he could be looking at death and he said he didn't do it. And they said, well, then you, you still need to plead guilty. So you don't go to death penalty. So anyway, they spend these, uh, four or five years in prison. She said that she was able to dupe authorities because she had learned details of the crime from newspaper articles and from reading the search warrant without the police noticing. I'm not sure how she got that. Um, She said she was able to point to the location of where Tanya Bennett's body was found based on the brush that had been cleared away. And I found out later in some reading that there was actually like a red marker up in the woodland. So between the news saying the area of where the body was found, she saw a brush cleared away and she sees a red marker. It's not too tough to be like, boop, that's it. And that was enough 
to implicate that that's what kills me is that at that time in that moment with that jurisdiction with whatever she said he did it he said he didn't they have they have audio of her telling him he did and her him saying he didn't at home without authorities present she brings in a swath of denim fabric that doesn't match the victim's pants but he failed a polygraph and she showed you an area where the body was found, but that was enough to get them both. I mean, I don't know, whatever that's wild to me, but think yeah. of the further re reaching implications. Not only now did a man, I don't care that she served time. She's the one who concocted the story, but not only <laughs> so did a man who, and why did she want to go to prison? Like not, well, not only did a, a man who didn't commit these murders go to prison which they've said of course it did but that he like essentially went insane in prison like he was the whole time like i didn't do this like losing his mind yeah um he so he he had to go to prison for all these years but think about what happened after tanya was after tanya's death seven more women were murdered i mean that's on her watch because <laughs> You know what I mean? Like if the real person or potentially on her watch, mm, right? Like yeah, potentially, right. potentially Keith could have gotten caught. Maybe he wouldn't have, or maybe he would have murdered two or three more, not seven more, but regardless. Way to think of that. You know what, what if I mean? there was like a civil suit from the other families? There had, there never was. Um, Laverne Damn. and John have both passed away. She had a heart condition and passed away in the early 2000s. I'm not sure how or when he passed away, but there was never, it's like she never really had it, held her feet to the flame. In fact, it's very, very, very interesting. Never did by three of you to it's one thing to get it's one thing to get the conviction overturned, and that's difficult enough in itself. We have what we had from uh, pre confession and what we had from Keith later on. So once Keith admitted to it, and Keith was in prison, it still took months and months to get Laverne and john out of prison and in fact they still didn't completely clear his record because he had been found guilty by by a jury of his peers so like he got out of prison but he still had like a murder charge it's wild Fuck. um right so i'd have killed laverne i'm assuming he wanted nothing to even job less do with her so <clears throat> so tanya i'll tell you a little bit about tanya um it's super sad. So like I said, she was 23, a bit mentally disabled. She had been at this tavern or at this bar playing pool with some friends in the afternoon. Keith walks in, sees her and these guys. Um, he's divorced at this point, living on his own. He sees her and she immediately ran up and hugged him. She didn't know him, but she hugged him and she was like, Hey, like come have fun with us or, you know, play pool or whatever. So he noticed that they didn't have any beer on the table and he thought they would ask him for money. So he stayed around for a little bit and then he left. But as he left, he started thinking about her hug and he started kind of um, obsessing over that hug. He'd never had a woman's affection. His mother's, he did get married. He was married for three or four years, but he never was very interested in sex um, from like, he would say that women just, he had a lot of, run-ins with prostitutes uh, along his truck routes and stuff like that. But he said that they only want, you know, that's all they want. They don't want more. Like he, he never felt like anything was more in depth than that. So he wasn't really interested in, in sex in that kind of way. Um, but her hug, like he could not stop thinking about. So he goes home, obsesses over this. And then he decides to drive back to see if she's there. Well, she was. And he asked her if he if she remembered him from earlier on in the day. And she did. And she's like, oh, yeah, I remember you. Because he said, you you hugged me. And she said, yeah, I remember you. What's up? Like, what are you doing? So they hang out there for a little bit. They leave. Uh, he offers to get her a bite to eat. Uh, they get in his car. And then he shows her his wallet and was like, ah, my wallet's empty. I've got a 20 at home. Do you mind if I just run over there and get it real quick? And she was like, no, that's fine. So they do. Uh, and he was like, well, come on in. He was like, I wouldn't mind to get a quick shave since we're going to go grab some dinner. So she does. And then ultimately he tries to kiss her. She kind of pulls away. He holds her down. Um, mm. This proceeds. But then she, but then she says like, she kind of relented a little bit and told him just like, just kind of like hurry up, like, let's go. And that, and he snapped as he did say that, when he during the time that they were kind of um getting involved sexually he did remember um 
some time with those kittens, like the things that he had done to them, like them dying because he strangled them. Um, and when she said, can you just hurry this up? Let's go. Like I'm hungry. <laughs> he lost it. But like I said, he already had the idea that women had no further, you know, no deeper reaching emotion, um, than, right. than just the sex. And so, um, he, uh, he said he just thought in his head, I can just end this. He started thinking that he could hold her as a sex slave for a little bit. So as all this is going on, these are the thoughts in his head. I can hang on to her for a little while. That's what Ted Bundy did. Like that was what he thought. Um, he said, I thought I could punch her once. Um, and then she would wake up hogtied and then she would be basically under my control. He hauled off and punched her. Um, I would be quite sure she's she was small, a very small woman. Again, he's six six or six seven. He's giant. I would assume his one punch probably knocked her flat out. In his head, though, the way he recollects it is that she was wide awake and he was confused because when he had done that to grown men, it laid him out. Mm. So he did it again and again and again and again. And in his head, he's saying, I don't understand it. She's still wide awake looking at me, telling me to stop. There's no way, right? Um, when he finally, I would say, comes to, I think he got in a fit, like an acute psychotic whatever, like a fit of rage. Her, I mean, teeth are missing. Her face is, she's unrecognizable. Um, and then he looks around and sees his room. And we were talking about blood earlier, right? So it, it's it's pretty rough. He does then strangle her. Pretty sure she didn't need it at this point. Um, and then he will go on to say, and this is tough to hear, but I'm only going to say it once, but he continues to say it for the rest of his victims that he would put his fist in their throat to make sure that they were gone. So he does this. Whoa. Like breaks their jaw and shit with his whole so, hand. You know, that's a good question because Where does he punch him in the throat. Well, so, so, okay. So, right. So I, I picture two things. I picture him maybe being so violent as to what you did, the first thing you said. Um, and that's what I thought he meant the first few things that I read about this. And I, like I said, I've read on this a, uh, on and off for a few years, but then sometimes it almost just sounds like maybe he put his fist to their throat, like pushed in on the outside, like, you know, you're, you're the outside of your throat, your trachea to kind of make sure that it just like punch, like just like punch their trachea and just like crush it. Cause right. if he put his fist in there, if he, he put his no way. fist in He's their mean. mouth, you would have like teeth marks cutting up your arm and shit, especially if he splintered the teeth and shit. But they were, yeah, I was going to say they're already, she's missing so many teeth and jaws are probably already very broken. He beat, almost all of his women were beaten. Um, how many did, how many people did he kill? Well, we know of eight. He's confessed eight. To eight. Yeah. eight? Oh, a spanning from Crestview, Florida, it looks like. So to... Florida is the only outlier. All the rest are pretty, except for like we've got Southern California, but the rest are kind of like Pacific Northwest, like that that chunk of um, yeah, the United States. Yeah, a lot of California, States. Oregon, Washington, mm -hmm. Washington. And did he have like a, a motive for all of them or were they just sporadic? So most of hookers? them. So Tanya I mean, was, was the... Tanya was the first one, and she was she was not a hooker. She was the first one and the only one that took place in his home. All the rest took place in his uh, truck, except for the last one. Okay, so he has a couple that are outside of his pattern, like a couple that are outside of his typical behavior. Um, so we'll just move through real quick. So we had um, Tanya. It's just oh, that one's terrible. That was just heartbreaking. And Lori um, and Pentland. Same well, we murder? have so 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 two the second later? murder, the second out of the eight, two were still unidentified. So um, Jane Doe, uh, we we know of her as Claudia in Blythe, California. He raped her and choked her to death. The third one, a woman named Cynthia. He, um, she came into his truck while he was sleeping. Uh, they they hung out for a little while. He's the he wrote letters to the Oregonian, a newspaper, saying that she was a prostitute, and he picked up and murdered her, and he signed it with a happy face. That was the first time he wrote to a newspaper. Yes, yeah, it sounds like a lot lizard, you know, sleeping in the lot. Um, the so there are there do become a lot of that. Yeah, there becomes a lot of um, prostitutes. That's why I say that Tanya, the first one, and then the last one are the outliers to that, though. Okay. Um, the fourth one um, was a prostitute that wanted to charge him double the price for sex. That made him snap, right. and that happened. Fifth one. Um, this, this is interesting. Actually, the fifth one was a Jane Doe, 
um, from 1992 until just this past April. All right. So yeah. for, <clears throat> so, mm-hmm. uh, so for 30 years, she was a, she was a Jane Doe. Um, she was identified this past April as Patricia Skipple. Um, so I want to say her name, but where six, is she, where, where was she at? That was in Santanella, California. Okay. Oh, there she is. Jane Doe, Cindy. I got you. Um, and then we have, she was actually known as Pacheco blue or blue Pacheco. I think, I don't know why it says Cindy. On that was one, she, and you said she was a prostitute. Um, we, they were, she was labeled as quote, a street person. So oh, maybe no, no. it, he never spoke on her any more than that. Um, the, how did they, how did they figure out who she was? Uh, DNA. Oh, cool. just this past April. Mm hmm. Uh, the sixth murder is, is the other one that is still a Jane Doe. She was the Crestview, Florida. He said, now, he said do they have the body or is these just, they're just going off the office? Of yeah. Yeah. These are bodies that they have. Well, they have, that he body. was able to give detail and say that he did this, but they're still, but they don't know who they are. We don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's fascinating. Mm hmm. And so, well, it's fascinating because like we, like I just said that, you know, the one has been, you know, identified just this past April. So that's, you know, mm -hmm. you know, good things are continuing to happen. But so now we're going to go on quickly to the seventh and eighth. These were both not in pattern. The seventh, she's in pattern because um, he picked her up at a truck stop and this and that. But they hung out for about a week until she nagged him um, to hurry up and get her to Indiana so she could be with her boyfriend. I'm sure that might be something he promised her he was going to do. So he did force sex upon her. He choked her. But he had let her use his card to make a phone call. Um, and he got concerned that this would give him up somehow, that his identity would be known. So after he murdered her, he ugh, uh, he tied her to underneath his truck um, and drove uh, so that she could not be identified. So that was out of pattern for him, um, that behavior. And then his last one, the eighth one, this is terrible. This is um, Julie Ann Winningham. And there's there's discrepancy on whether or not she was his fiance. Regardless, they had actually been friends for years. He had known her for years. And then they did get in a romantic relationship. Um, he felt like she was only after his money. This is another thing that continues to be a, a pattern with him is the money situation. Um, eventually there's a lot more to this part. This is a story that we could do over two or three episodes to be fair, to do it justice. You know what I'm saying? Um, right. So I'm just kind of skipping over the surface of this, but just he, the relationship he has with Julie, his last victim is enough to talk about for 45 minutes. Um, what, 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 what was it? What, like, I mean, well, briefly, yeah. like what was his relationship? Well, just that he had known her for so many years. So number one, that's just out of pattern. That's not what these other women were. The first one was the impulse kill. But then after that, it became like this very specific on his truck routes. He would dispose of their body this way. You know what he I mean? Just like they were the lot less he, he just had a, he had a niche. Well, and she pissed him off. Yeah. But, but then, and his daughter, his daughter, that's a whole separate, his daughter has her own podcast about her father. I mean, this goes further reaching wow. and further reaching. Whoa. So, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So that would that's suck to be the, the daughter of, of that dude. Uh, is she fucked up? She's or? well, we'll touch on that, but she, you know, her point was kind of that, that if he could do this to his friend, he, then she's like, God, he could have done it to any of us. Right. Um, right. Because that was out of his behavior. So um, with Julie, his last victim, um, they were able to track him down this way because he had so many ties to her. I mean, they lived together. They were going to, they potentially okay. were going to get married. Okay. So he's found out about, and then he, as he gets um, brought in for questioning there with that, he starts to confess. Um, he was released for, he was arrested for questioning and released. Um, he didn't confess immediately. But then he quote, I, I just don't believe this for a minute. He quote over tried to overdose on sleeping pills. Some say Tylenol. Uh, he did write a letter to his brother to say that he feed my cats um, that that he 
um, had tried to commit suicide the night before that he took an entire bottle of or 47 sleeping pills and he just woke up well rested. That was what he said. Like it didn't do the job. Uh, his brother, by the way, he confessed to everything to his brother in that letter and his brother, uh, to his credit, did take that letter to police. Um, but he was taken into custody, returned to Washington state. The brother turns the letter over to police. And then while he was in jail, he confessed to the murder of um, Angela, who was the seventh victim, the one that he drug under the truck. Um, her body was found by the details that he gave. You couldn't identify her. Um, this was... Oh. So he, he starts getting upset, which is pretty typical for some of these guys, right? These, these killers like this, these predatory killers. He becomes upset that other people are starting, that other people had notoriety for his, uh, for his wow. murders, right? So here, so enter Laverne and John again, right? So he, that's when he had, so he had written on that bathroom wall about Tanya. Um, he led investigators to Tanya's, to the field where they could find her purse. So that's how he proved that he did it rather than them. Okay. So he said, go look at this place in this field, you know, and they took him there and it was overgrown. So a man led a troop of boy scouts out and they spent days and days clearing these blackberry bushes, which grow, they, they proliferate and grow crazy in this part in yeah. Oregon. So it's very, you know, thorny and thick brush. They spend days clearing all this brush, find her purse with her ID in it. Tanya's that Whoa. first victim. Whoa. So this exonerates Laverne and John. Damn. And it takes a while, but yes. So it implicates Keith for sure in their murders or in her murder. What does John um, do after he's exonerated? I mean, he just fall off the map besides. Just yeah, he, he did kind of fall off the map. I mean, he did die, I mean, but he, God, how, I think how traumatic. They just, say that that, they just always said that he went crazy. I also don't. Yeah, think I would go crazy really too. Agreed. Obviously he's already crazy. Cause he's marrying that old bitch. Well, and because he, literally was like i don't remember dumping don't a body laverne that. you know and she's like but you did it's the worst thing you've done and he's like well yeah, she must you know i mean like, like she must have like some kind of weird like you know yeah, that control weird over him. control kind of mm -hmm. shit yeah so i don't you, know, you I got don't any think... you got any cubs you got any cubs that you got control over <laughs> lord no <laughs> that's what they call them right cubs. i don't know i don't know what they call them <laughs> <laughs> So tell me one more time, what is this picture of him in prison or this is before? Yeah, he had to have been because he was much younger than that. I mean, you saw that the picture. So of what him is he? Uh, why is he wearing jeans and a? My assumption shirt? is that he's been taken out to show him something where a body was or something. I mean, he's become like this prop at this point. Um, but that smile with that smiley face, like, look how cute I am. And oh, this is what I wrote in my letters. You know, that's where I'm like, oof, I just. Oof. So. God, only a face a mother could love. He claimed that he murdered 160 women. At another point, he said 187. Other sources said that. He later that recanted here. that. No, I know. I'm just saying, like, he says a lot of things. Yeah. Um, he did plead guilty to Julie Ann's. That was his fiance's murder, the last one. Um, blah, blah, blah. He was arrested March 30th of 95 and convicted in October of that same year. Um, and... Yeah, so he's serving, I think, either five or six uh, life sentences. Uh, like, he's not why, serving. Like, why are we just killing this guy at this point? Like, this, Thank why you. Why just fucking end it? Like, exactly. Put this bitch in the chair and let's go. You mm -hmm. know? Ugh. Why is this guy still First of all, it's Oregon, so it's not going to happen. But Never. No, it's never going to happen. But Not one kid yeah. gets... So then I will say, let me say this quickly. And, Where, and he was it. born in Washington. Where was this guy born? He was born in Canada and they moved to Washington oh. state. So mm. let me say this really fast. There's something called T and F online.com. And I forget, I have to look at it. It's uh, the name, like two names, T and F um, online. So they had, there's a website that if you totally geek out, um, on like the psychology behind this kind of thing this website if i like i didn't stumble upon this until just recently i didn't see it the first time i was looking at all this stuff i'll put a link in on um on andrea up late or on failure to stop and you can go back and read this stuff it's called the journal of personality assessment and they take different people so like he agreed to go through all this 
testing later, the psychological testing, like once he was in prison. So they did like the Rorschach and they did the, um, some PET scans, like brain scans to show, um, different, it'll get like thermals, different things of the brain. Um, multiple personality type testings and things like this. The, the title for the personality, dis it was called personality disorder traits, um, Rorschach performance, neuropsychological functioning in the case of a serial killer, the importance of a multi-level approach in the assessment of personalities associated with extreme and repetitive violence. And they just ad nauseum provide these tests. I'm saying this because he met the diagnostic criteria for antisocial personality disorder, which is not um, a surprise. I don't think he meets four of five narcissistic personality disorder traits. So grandiosity, entitlement, lack of empathy, arrogance. Um, I will just bore you with one more little, I'm not, I'm not, cause that's tiny writing. I'm not going to do that. I'll take a picture of it on my computer screen, but all that to say, he doesn't, he doesn't fit really the narrative of, um, like he has, he has small qualities of a lot of different psychopathy, right? So like, uh, like three out of five of like a, a schizo, uh, diagnosis or like four out of five of this, the only one he could be for sure diagnosed on was antisocial personality disorder, which many, if not all of these serial killers have. But um, I will post a link because it's really interesting to hear what they have to say about his brain scans and this and that. About his daughter, her name is Melissa. People can kind of take her either way. She, the one interesting story she has is that during the divorce, she she's just kind of now like uh, aligning the time that she's spent with her father growing up with the dates of these murders and thinking, oh gosh, that was when I was this age and we had gone to McDonald's for my, you know what I mean? And being like, God, oh, he had just done this and I had no idea. One time she was spending the night at his home in a guest bedroom and laid in the bed and, or I think on a couch in there and looked at the ceiling and was confused because she thought that there was um, dried uh, spaghetti sauce on the ceiling and couldn't make sense of that and didn't think anything else of it. That was around the time of, and in the same room that Tanya Bennett, the first one, the only one that was killed in his home was killed. Oh. So things like that. Of course, that messed with her mentally. She was a teenager. I think she was 15 when she found out um, what her father had done oh. or when he was arrested. So it started, I guess, when she was 10. He was arrested when she was 15. Uh, so she's gone on, like I said, to have podcasts and shows. She's reached out to the families of the victims. And, you know, it's interesting because they're not all very receptive to her. And they will say, I don't like, think I would well, give a fuck. That's man. what I'm I was saying. Like, don't talk to me, bitch. You're dead fucking. Well, killed so my it's loved they will say things like, it's not your fault. Like, I don't blame you. This was your father. You know, you're not to blame here. Also, I don't want to talk to you. Yeah, it's and, like, you're not the victim, bitch. <laughs> like, well, well, and I know why she feels like she is, right? I get, I why get she, it, but she, she's not. <laughs> I, like, I know. And so she will say, like, um, you know, basically for her to have closure, for her, this and that. And, okay, everybody, you know, to each his own. But th what they'll say, what the sister of Tanya said, and she is a bit older than Tanya. And, again, Tanya had a bit of a mental disability. And she said, yeah, I'm her sister, but I was also more like her mother. And she said, you know, where I have a problem is that, you know, your father did all this. And she was like, now you've written books. You have TV shows. You have a podcast. Right. Now I feel like all I hear is you and your father and no one's talking about my sister and what kind of person she was. Right. So it's rubbed some people the wrong way. A few did meet with her. This woman, Tanya's sister, did meet with her eventually. She met with um, Melissa and her mother, the ex-wife. And she had questions for the ex-wife, too, because they weren't married very long, four or five years. But she said, you know, like, did you have any idea? And she's like, I had no, I would not have known. So it ultimately was good. I mean, they had their meeting, but she, so when you asked about the daughter, um, I, I mean, I feel like, you know, if you genuinely do care, if you genuinely have empathy, um, then you would shut the fuck up about all of it. Like, yeah, I, I, think I think you would say, she, I think you'd be like, well, for closure, I want to reach out to him, but like, I'm just going to give myself closure by saying, yeah, but maybe I'm not going to do it to. out of respect. And that's my closure yeah. because yeah. making it all about you, is probably the worst thing. And, and I, and yeah, I would not want to talk to the daughter of the man who fucking murdered one of my loved ones. Like it, well, well, and one, especially, I would, I she, think, her, she's part of the bloodline. So she'd have to go anyway. Well, I would go with, and I would go with, um, it's one thing to, to meet with her if you choose to, 
but for it to be on um, a podcast or for a book article, right? That's where I feel like it's like ugh, it gets a little in the weeds. Yeah, there. I guess if somebody reaches out to you, then you know it, it's okay to you know because it's not like you went to them; they came to you. But I, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to hear from. Well, she has Would her own you? show and different that. If, if uh, um, some dude like murdered, you know, one of your kids uh, and the daughter wanted to reach out to you, would I mean, would you want to hear what she had to say? I think I can't even um, uh, honestly no. answer that question. No, like I would like to say, no, I would like to say no. I think it would depend on her approach and like at what point after and it would just, there'd be so many variables. I, I don't know. And even still, it wouldn't be because she has a podcast or has a book like that. Right, definitely right. not for, for that kind of well, thing. Well, okay. Yeah. Like yeah, going back on that, right? Like if she didn't have a book, if she didn't have a podcast, she reaches out to you. I mean, my answer is still no, but I'm not going to hate the bitch. But like, if she's got a podcast and she's got these books and then she reaches out to me, I'm going to be like, are you, I mean, she, I yeah, it's a crazy, uh, that was a really good episode. Your internet worked out well. Um, the only thing, uh, that, that happened was we got kicked off a little bit late, but Hey, I mean, I'll go late every time. If your internet's going to be this good. First time I've ever been able to see your face on the show. Um, It's me. It's awesome. Well, uh, if you want to support the show, please like and hammer the YouTube button. Please share it on your Facebook. Uh, very simple to share from your Facebook. Um, did you get my text message about that? I did. Um, let me tell you. <laughs> That's a pretty important text message. Okay. I mean, I can do that. Is that yeah, what we're doing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll give the runner up. Give the, I'll send the runner up. Uh... I would like for the runner up to get something then. Okay. Well, let me think of what we're going to give the runner up before we now to one. Uh, what do I have from sponsors? Oh, here we go. Gunfighter, gunfighter candle. Oh, good idea. It's a brand new. I, I, I'll put it in the box, back in the box and everything. Well, then I'll give a nice one. This one's called Night Shift. Come from Gunfighter Candle. So the the overall winner who put a lot of time and work into their uh, their choice gets the Manscaped 4.0 package. The runner up uh, gets the Night Shift Gunfighter Candle by Gunfighter Candle Co. Trying to find it so I can put it on here. Um, I had I, I was confused on what we're doing. All right, so oh, there it is. So the <laughs> um, I will say the runner-up probably needs the manscape more so than. Okay. Uh, we'll, well, tell me who, who's, um, the so who's the runner-up? Who's the runner-up? The, you want the runner-up first? Yeah, fuck yeah. Well, then let me go back. The runner-up, are you listening? <laughs> is I'm gonna pull up the picture that the runner-up sent. Okay, the runner-up sent this, which in my brain vies for a complete winner, and it's Lastro Lopez who sent Lauren. Oh who identifies yeah. As she, her, she. Oh, well, Lastro Lopez. He's a gunfighter, so he should get. He's a fucking paintballer, so he'll love this candle. So I last row, you're getting the candle, but this was dope. And he said that he found Lauren on a dating site in Austin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that was, I got, more I did responses. laugh. I did laugh really hard on that one. I got more responses from that. Do you know what most people said? I didn't even tell you this. What? Probably at least five people said that Lauren looks more like Tansy than Tansy looks like Tansy. <laughs> Man, fuck y'all. Fuck y'all. <laughs> okay. So Show the, the winner's winner. picture. I'm going to do it. The winner. Um, you guys didn't see this because I didn't post it because I was Why trying to be a nice it? podcast partner. I didn't. No, I just super didn't. Funny. Super funny. All right. The winner is Jacob Bayer, who said this was Eric's doppelganger. Oh, yeah, that's not the right picture, though. He oh, he had the picture with me side by side. If you don't have it, that's okay. We'll, he didn't we'll do a side by side for me. He did and a I side by side, side for me. Side. He did a side by side for me. Yeah, and it was that picture sideways with my hair slicked back sideways. <laughs> but he like went through my Facebook to find like the exact picture. Well, I, yeah, and I didn't even I didn't do that for yours because I wasn't going to post that one. Uh, well, that was very nice of you, but uh, it made me laugh uncontrollably and hysterically, and. Um, 
All right, Jacob, you're getting the man. Go, good, good job, Jacob bear. Um, if you guys want to support the show again, hammer that link button, support our sponsors, get you a ghost bed this Valentine's day, get a ghost bed pillow. Um, get the cooling sheets, get all the things, man. Get, enjoy manscape 4.0 rip pack. Still got the promo code with rip pack up there. It's uh promo code. What is it? Like, I think it's the promo code. It's just Wolfpack. It's Wolfpack. It's Wolfpack. Get you that fifty percent off of that fucking. We crushed it this weekend. Uh, we did a, an event with the kids. Um, my kids' podcast, Gromit Vomit Podcast. Um, and, and and so we gave out some rip packs and stuff there. So um, we'll do a rip pack giveaway. Let's do the uh, do a rip pack giveaway on this show. Send us your best bathroom graffiti. Okay. And I'll let you choose this time. And I'll send a pack of rip packs with a little t- rip pack toothbrush uh, to you. Um, best by the way, if you, and bonus speaker. points. If you can get a picture of it, if you can go back to that rest stop and relive it, um, go for bonus it. points. Oh, if you get a bonus, with it. bonus points. If you go and make your own bathroom graffiti and drop Andrea, I'll play it on there. <laughs> oh, that would be a winner. <laughs> that would be a winner. And leave the com center number. <laughs> yes. That would be it, dude. If you like, oh my gosh, for a glory hole experience, call Andrea up late and then drop the com center. I'm not telling anybody to commit a crime here, but if you as did, this is the com center's number. That's fine. That would be really funny. That would be really, that was a really good episode. Good job. Couldn't have done yeah, better yeah. myself. That was fun. Was got, fun. Uh, got a very special guest tomorrow for last call. Do you want to tease it? You want to tell it or uh, no, not really. But the um I mean the Friday breakdown, so good. So good. It's gonna be so good. If you didn't hear our last Friday's breakdown, the last everybody was said great. it was our best show. Everybody was it was fantastic. Was this one's gonna top it. This one by far is gonna top it. I'm so excited for Failure South 2.0. We got such a good thing going. We have such a good team of researchers and, and people all just everybody's pulling their pulling their weight right now, and it's just I just like the way it's going. Your fucking internet looks great. Uh, overpaid producer. Um, I mean, underpaid producers uh, crushing it for us all the time. We've got dead leg media doing research in the background. We got Jonathan Bates and uh, you know, of course, Drew Breezy, just bringing that, that side of professionalism that, that, that only can be found in a Lieutenant or above retired. Um, so yeah, I like where everything's going right now. Should, should be a fun year, but yeah, all yeah. right, last row. Congratulations, you've won the gunfighter candle, and uh, you've got to come to North Carolina. Jake to Bear, get you've up. won the the manscaped shit. So, um, yes, Rip Pack. I'm seeing Rip Pack on Amazon. Are they selling on Amazon or is it? Nope, they they sell on Amazon. And I believe I believe they were working on a Walmart deal or some kind of deal like that. Don't don't quote me on that. I know I, I talked to the owner. Um, I, t- I probably talked to him like once a month, but we, at some point he was either, it was either Walmart or maybe it was Cabela's or something. Oh, fuck. I'm sorry. Ada Marie just sent me a picture that says life is like a box of chocolate. Chocolate. It's spelled wrong. <laughs> Did you just write this on your wall though? Cause it looks like a living room wall with a Sharpie, but it says chocolate. Oh, that's oh, okay. Uh, I was like a box yeah. of chocolates. That's funny. Oh, she yeah, said it's a storage them. unit, not a bathroom. Made me cackle when I saw it. That's hilarious. Oh, man. Gosh, thank um, you, Ada. And they built some brand new bathrooms at Camp McCall, which is where uh, much of the Green Beret training takes place on, on a special operations side of Fort Bragg in a little place called Camp McCall. And they built these brand new brand new facilities. And uh, they had stainless steel toilets, prison toilets, and uh, stainless steel walls. And it was like not even a week. And we were the only class out there. And well, yeah, they, they, they could only chalk it off that maybe it was a selection class before us. But we all got called in on one by one. But somebody carved in the new stainless steel doors of the new bathrooms on camera call. Tansy is gay. Brand new special operations facility. Somebody carved Tansy is gay. They thought it was me. They tried. They they questioned me very hard about it. And I said, "Why would I write? Why would I say that I'm fucking gay? Why would I come out? If I'm going to come out, I'm not coming out in a fucking Camp McCall bathroom. I'm coming out like hard. I'm coming out like in a glory hole in a 
Seven Eleven in Hinesville, Georgia. Exit one seventy three. Third stall. That's where I'm coming out. All right, guys. Until next time. Guns up. Giddy up. Good night, y'all. <laughs>